Barrel children. As a small child, I was left with Grandma in Jamaica by my ambitious mother. Seeking a better life in Britain's cold mother country, like so many others, I was a barrel child of the Windrush generation who, after many years, was sent for. I could never have imagined what this country, in school and work, for me had in store. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-servicemen who know England. They serve this country well. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. Discouraged but full of hope, they sailed for Britain. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. While we often know the stories of the Windrush generation, the generation of Caribbean migrants who were invited to the United Kingdom to help rebuild Britain's weakened economy after the Second World War. We know less of the stories of the children they left behind, many of whom barely knew their parents because they were left in the care of grandparents or extended relatives at a young age. Often, the only tangible connections these children had with their parents were the care packages that were sent to them in a barrel. To capture the experiences and ongoing realities of the barrel children, who eventually reunited with their parents in the United Kingdom. I met with three Barrow children, Diane, June, and Lynn Ford. Diane worked as a foster carer for 23 years. Now, she's retired and enjoys poetry and writing. Jean is an intuitive healer and teacher who takes pleasure in mindfulness activities. And Linford is a black history researcher, educator, Caribbean genealogist, and author. They share the triumph and trauma of being a barrel child and their enduring connection to their homeland. Diane was just three years old when her mother left her in the care of a grandmother in Jamaica. But the love and care she initially received soon turned into a bittersweet experience where she had to go live with another family member. My mom left me with my grandmother in Portland when I was three years old. And um, yeah, it was a, a very difficult time. And I remember even though I was only three, funnily enough, I actually remember where we lived in Kingston. My grandma was a lovely person, very strict. And I remember her saying to me, you need to be the best that you can be. So unfortunately, grandma died when I was six and I was sent to live with a cousin. But she did not treat me very nice. She was horrible to me to the extent where it was her husband who used to defend me. And I remember him getting really angry one day, you know, when she was going to beat me. And, to, you know, if you touch that child again, you're going to have to beat me too. Separated from her mother at the age of two and raised by her aunts, Jean's life as a borrowed child provided her with everything and more that she could ask for. My childhood experience was very, very good. And I think that was where the problem lied. I was so loved. I was so nurtured. I was so cared for. And that's, that was the connection that I had with my aunt. This is a picture of my beloved aunt that raised me from the age of about two or three. And um, she was just such a delightful lady. I, I, I can't find any fault with her. And I, I, I think that's what, where, where the, the trauma had come in. So my parents wouldn't mean anything to me. Jean's brother, Linford, also has pleasant childhood memories of them in Jamaica, even though they did not grow up together. 
Well, back in Jamaica, I did see my sister. I used to go to um, the St. Thomas, which is the parish in which she lived, um, to see my aunt. And when I did go to St. Thomas, we had lots of fun going, uh, catching um, fish and shrimps and um, taking the goats to, you know, out and uh, bringing them back in. And, you know, the usual thing that children do. Uprooted from their home in Jamaica, leaving behind people that had become their family, the borrow children embarked on a journey to a foreign land they had never seen. This marked the beginning of another chapter in their lives, a chapter marked by overwhelming uncertainties. So when you saw your mother for the very first time, what was your thoughts of her? How did you feel? Coming to England and yeah. my mom being late picking me up from the airport. And when she came and I saw this tall, absolutely beautiful woman, like a model yeah. in a blue suit, similar color to my, the suit my, my aunt had made me. And I looked at her and I thought, oh my goodness, that can't be my mom. She's too beautiful. Oh no, they've made a mistake. They've got the wrong person. And then she came up to me and she was hugging and kissing me. Oh, baby, baby. Oh, it's so lovely to see you. And every time she kissed me, her lipstick came off on my face. We got, we got out the airport and then we went, we were in the car. We drove from Manchester Airport, you know, down to where we lived in Old Trafford. And on the way, I was looking at the houses going, I'd never seen houses like this all close together and they look like rabbit hutches. <laughs> I'm thinking, do people really live in these? Oh, oh no, there must be factories. Just like a lot of other people said when they came here, they thought the houses were factories. And I remember um, the first time, winter, the first time I saw smoke, because I came here in August. And then when the weather got cold and people started putting the light in the coal fires, because we had coal fires in those days. And I remember seeing the smoke coming out the chimney, like everybody else, I thought, if I went screaming, I ran back into the house screaming to my, Mommy, Mommy, the house is on fire, the house is on fire. <laughs> and she had to reassure me. And there were so many things. Like she introduced me to snow. The first time she saw, I had only seen snow on films. The first time I saw snow, I ran out, not realizing it was ice, nearly fell. So then she said, then I picked up a handful of snow and I thought it had burnt my hand. I threw it away again and screamed. I said, mommy, it's burnt my hand. She said, no, 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 come here, come here. Look, it's all right. It's all right. And she told me I had to make um, a snowball. <laughs> While Deanne had a warm and happy welcome, Jean had a different experience where she met a parent for the first time. At that moment when I saw my father, I only recognize him because he looked like a member of the family. And I think that just made me say, oh, that is my father. But I was still quite traumatized by it because he didn't say anything to me. There was no greeting. There was no welcome. There was nothing. When I arrived at the house, there were two ladies in the living room. And my first impression was, um, one of them it must be my mom, and I thought it was one particular lady, but it wasn't. Then my father said, "Oh, here's your mother," and I was like, in my mind, I'm thinking that's not my mother because it's the first time that I was going to see my mother and recognize what she actually looked like. For many of the borrowed children. Navigating their new reality and trying to build a parent and child bond that had never existed posed huge challenges. I remember two weeks after I came here, mom got a job in the evening and I, I was left to look after my, my, my five-year-old sister. My brother was four at the time and the baby who was one. She gave me instructions. I could make them hot chocolate at half past, half past seven. I made them hot chocolate and then we had what we call bun, you know, bun and cheese or things, whatever they wanted. And then I had to make sure that they had a wash, which you call tidy. I had to make sure they tidied. And then they had to, they had to be in bed for eight o'clock. On the one occasion that I got up to go to the toilet and didn't look at the time, she came home, thought I had been watching TV. So I was beaten. How were you able to manage 
you know, caring for your siblings and at the same time schooling. In those days, you know, you'd, you'd go to school with bruises, whatever, whatever. Nobody would even notice. But I, I managed. How I managed, I don't know. But I just did what mom said. Jean, on the other hand, resisted her parents' orders. Unlike Diane, who reunited with her mother at the age of nine, Jean arrived in the UK when she was 15 years old, introducing its own sets of challenges. There was a major cultural difference between myself and my parents. They seemed like they were stuck in time, a time in Jamaica that had passed. My father left in 1959 and I came here in 1972. So the, there's, such, there's such a difference in, in, in culture. My mother would say to me, I need to help her with the washing and I need to, to do the washing, the washing of the clothes. Now, I grew up with my aunt and my aunt always said, it's a woman's responsibility to wash the clothes, not the children. So when I came here, my mother's insisting that I, I wash the clothes and I said to her, no, I'm not washing the clothes. It's, it's not my, I repeated what my aunt had said. I said, I'm not washing. It's your responsibility to wash your husband's clothes. And of course, my mother was a livid. How dare you say that to me? And it was, a, it was the way I was brought up. While Jean struggled to understand her mother's cultural values and expectations of her, Linford also found it tough to create a connection with his father. My experience with my father uh, initially it seemed okay, but then I started to realize that it wasn't what I expected. You know, I expected my father to operate a certain way, but he'd been here five years. So culturally, he'd sort of assimilated a little into the British culture. So some of the words he used is like, I beg your pardon, you know, and things like that, which just didn't make sense to me. He's basically saying, I beg your pardon, but it's the way he said it. And we never use those terms in, you know, in, in Jamaica. Now, why have you come to England? To seek a job. And what sort of job do you want? Any type, so long as I get a good pay. A major reason many of the Windrush generation made the sacrifice to leave their children behind was their hope to provide them with a better life and opportunities. But for the borrowed children, a better life held different meanings. As a borrowed child, one of the first impact on my life is the education, is not being able to fulfill my dreams and my ambition that I brought with me from the Caribbean of finishing school, getting my qualifications, which I didn't. I didn't even sit my GCSE. The school system was so different from what I was used to. And the children in particular, I find that they didn't have the same attitude towards education as how I was brought up in Jamaica. Whereas for me, getting an education was so important because that was one of the things that was sold to me. So going on to say, I was doing the course and I was doing very well and I was really enjoying it. Without real warning or anything, I just started feeling unwell. It was like a battery running down and I just kept going. And the more I tried to push myself, the more I just feel myself just slowing down. In the end, I just, I just had to give up, especially because of the cognitive function. Despite the trauma of being uprooted, which hindered her from completing her education, Jane remained determined to pursue her dream in the career path she had always wanted. Before I leave Jamaica, I wanted to work in an office. You know, I used to remember seeing the young 
the older girls coming home from secretarial college and I'll just run up to the top of the road and I'll just look at them and I'm saying that's going to be me one day. So of course when I came to the, came to the United Kingdom I continued to pursue that. I did apply for several office junior posts because I had a very good standard English. So when I phone up for a job I was told come to the interview because they didn't hear an accent. And as soon as I turned up and they saw me, I was told, no, post is full. And I did that over and over and over again. And in the end, I had no choice. I had to choose to go and work in a factory. So again, that was, that was the trauma. So all, all the, every step of the way, for me personally anyway, it was just that trauma. And all I can think about was how different my life would have been if I was in Jamaica. I know a lot of people thinking, well, you know, Jamaica's a poor country and, you know, I wouldn't have achieved that. This was the best place for me. It was not the best place for me because there was no foundation here. Like Jean, Diane also experienced her own fair share of racism. Last year at primary school, that's when I discovered racism. Because I remember this girl, we were in the playground, this girl came up to me and pulled her fist back, called me the N-word and was about to punch me. And then the whistle went. So everybody ran, you know, and lined up. And then she said to me, right, I'm going to get you tonight at the end, I'm, at the end of school, I'm going to get you. You know, and again, the N-word. And yes, when I finished school, she was waiting at the gate with her friends and she just came up to me and punched me in my face. And I think, fortunately, I used to suffer from nosebleeds. So even if I blew my nose too hard, it would bleed. My nose just started pouring in blood. And her friends were so frightened, they all ran away. So she ran, she ran away with them. And that was how I wasn't beaten up. I was just punched. But there was a lovely gentleman, our class teacher. He, when he realised what was happening, I think he told the other teachers. He got me reading my, he awakened my interest in poetry because he used to read poems to us at the end of the day after school. And one day, I think he noticed how much I enjoyed the poem. So he called me and he said, Diana, you really liked those poems, didn't you? And I said, yes, sir. I said, right, take this book home and read it. And then when you finish, bring it back. Having experienced the emotional disconnection she did with her mother, she was set on spending more time with her daughter and in the process, she found fulfillment. Would you say that your expectations of coming here was met? Yes, and my expectations of moving to the UK, I think I've achieved those expectations because when I came here as a little girl, I didn't know what to expect. The things my grandmother said to me as a little three-year-old, that was in my head all the time. I have to be the best I can be. I have to make granny proud of me. So that kept me going. I applied for jobs that other people didn't apply for. Uh, I was a manager. I managed a local refuge for women and children fleeing domestic violence. When I saw, you know, the children that were coming into the refuge and how they were being treated, a lot of them were taken away from the parents, put into care. At the time, I wanted to spend more time with my youngest daughter because the, the, the job was full on. Because I just thought, well, if I do fostering, I'll be at home. I'd be able to spend more time with my daughter. And because, unfortunately, I was on my own. I was a single parent. I thought I'll be able to spend more time with my daughter and look after her the way I want to. And I'll be able to do something to help other children. So I resigned from my job managing the, the local refuge and I became a foster carer. I intended to, to foster for about two years, you know, until my daughter was old enough to go to school and come home by herself and whatever. But I liked it so much. I fostered for nearly 23 years. And when I retired, I was told that I'd fostered over 40 children, 45, 46 children. As for Linford, he ultimately believes that coming to the United Kingdom was a good decision for him. For me, it was a good opportunity to, to be educated and to get a career and to, um, 
to do a variety of things. It was also, I had more access to information. Um, if I'd lived in the country area of Jamaica, I wouldn't have that access. We didn't have libraries and all of that in the same way, you know, that, you know, I could just um, walk, walk or run for five minutes and I'm in a library, <laughs> you know, in this country. And I, I was the kind of child that just enjoyed reading. So that, that actually helped. The experiences of these borrowed children have woven a narrative of both triumph and trauma. Whatever path their lives have taken in the United Kingdom, they still nurture a profound connection and deep longing for their homeland. After you got here at the age of nine, did you ever return to Jamaica? As soon as I was able, I started to work. I, I, I saved money and went back to Jamaica. I, as soon as I, I think it was in my 20s, because I took my daughter with me. And I think she must have been about um, six or seven at the time. But I wanted her to see where I came from. And all of what I was going through, the whole time, all I could think about was, I want to go home. I still, I still couldn't feel connected to the United Kingdom. I took my three children so they could get to know the place. And that feeling when I'm there is so good. Being left behind by parents has many complex levels, not easily seen, understood or discussed, so we still cannot rest. For the emotional and psychological long-term damage is deeply embedded with stories closely held to our chests. But tapping into our warrior ancestors' resilience gave us strength to overcome adversity and survive.